All right. Hey, this morning we are kicking off a new series called The Journey, and just really excited about that. What we're going to be doing these next few weeks leading in to Christmas is uh, just talking about some of the different personalities that sort of descended upon the nativity scene and kind of the different journeys that they took to get there and sort of how it relates to, to my life and your life. How many of you uh, how many of you own a nativity scene of some kind? It's like, in, okay, so a lot of you. So actually, we didn't really own a nativity scene, but I want to show you our nativity here because I'm pretty proud of it. In fact, we're going to put a picture up on the screen as well. But uh, this is our Lego nativity scene, and this is completely... The, uh, the creation of Logan, he just like just dreamed this up one day. And so I was like, hey, cool, we don't have a nativity scene, but now we do. So uh, Logan doesn't get his Legos back because I think these are going to go in the box with the Christmas decorations when it's all said and done for next year too. But uh, if you want to take a closer look at that, he did an awesome job on that. And nobody made him do it. He just like one day walked upstairs like, hey, look what I made. I'm like, whoa, that's cool. So that's our nativity scene. But, uh, you know, you, many of you raised your hand. You have a nativity scene. We're pretty familiar with that cast of characters that, that shows up at the nativity. But uh, this series that we're going to be going through, the journey, is just all about kind of the different roads that, that each one of those characters or personalities took to get there because they didn't just show up accidentally. Each one of them had a part to play in this, in this story. And and, uh, and, you know, obviously this story is huge. The, the historical timeline of humanity has literally hinged upon this very story that literally our calendar went from B.C. to A.D. based upon the events that took place there in Bethlehem. And so it's a, it's a hugely important story, and we're going to just kind of dig into it from a little bit of a different angle in the weeks moving forward. I'm really excited this morning because I feel like God's given me something really good to start it off with. And we're going to be talking about Mary and Joseph and sort of their journey at arriving at Bethlehem that Christmas night. Now, this is part of the story that, that most of us, I think we probably know this pretty well if we've grown up here in America and grown up at all around church. You're familiar. But actually, you know, I, I did a little research this week and, and uh, I saw Barna, who is like the foremost leader in, in church statistics, they released a survey here not too long ago that said this, that only 35% of Americans now associate the Jesus aspect of Christmas as the most important part of Christmas. Okay? That this story that we're going to talk about, it's only about a third of Americans actually think this is the most important part of Christmas. To most people, the most important part of Christmas is getting together with family or you know, some of the other components. But and so, and so as a culture, we're losing touch with this story. So I don't want to assume that you, that you know this story inside and out, though many of us perhaps do. That being said, we're just going to quickly go through a refresher. I'm going to read two passages. They're both a little lengthy. We're just going to read them start to finish on the front end, and then I'm going to elaborate on them this morning. The first is Luke chapter 1, and these both are just kind of the significant portions of the Christmas story as it re- pertains to Mary and, and Joseph. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 says this, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and, you, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Okay, so that's Luke chapter 1. And now I'm just, again, just going to read one more passage. And this is Matthew chapter 1. This is what Matthew chapter 1 says. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. 
Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quickly, quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took, to, took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Mary and Joseph are perhaps two of the most unlikely or unexpected people that God has ever used. And yet use them he did And not just for an ordinary purpose, he used their lives to completely change the scope of human history. First you have Mary. The Bible doesn't say uh, how old she was, but the the history books would suggest to us, knowing the the Israelite culture uh, would tell us that she was likely in her early teens, that it was a very common thing, even at the age of 13. Do we have any 13-year-old girls in the house? Any of you 13? Okay, any 13-year-old boys in the house? Okay, we got some in the back. Okay, so at age 13, that they they could be betrothed at that age into marriage in that culture. So imagine, you know, little 13 year olds running around getting married. It's hard to fathom here, but that was the culture. Okay. And so there she was at the ripe old age of about 13, 14, 15, something like that. And where does Mary live? She lives in a town called Nazareth. Now, you know, what are the requirements of a town here in Stearns County? Anybody know what the requirements of a town in Stearns County are? Two, two requirements, Catholic church and a bar, right? That's the requirements for a, a town in in Stearns County. So I grew up in Jacob's Prairie. It's got the Catholic Church. There's no bar. So it does not count as an official Stearns County town, okay? But I pheasant hunt over by Roscoe, which is another little town. They've got a Catholic Church and a bar, so it's actually considered a town. So Nazareth, okay, it's kind of like in that realm of things, right? It's just this little village. It's just this little, this, this tiny little place. It's, you know, it's, it's Avon or it's Freeport or it's Holding Ford or it's Kimball. It's, you know, it's a place like that that's sort of just like not really on most people's grid. It's just this quiet place that the vast majority of the world doesn't really care all that much about. In fact, years later, when when uh, one of Jesus' followers, a, a guy by the name of Nathaniel, he would find out that Jesus came from Nazareth, and his response was, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? You know, so you kind of put this together. You have this ordinary teenage girl, and she kind of comes from this, this, you know, afterthought of a town. And by the way, she's engaged to sort of this, this common carpenter. I mean, it's not exactly the picture of excitement. It's not exactly the kind of person you expect these great things and heroic things to come from. And then you have Joseph, okay? And, and everything I just said about Mary basically applies to, to Joseph as well. He's also from, from Nazareth. He's just kind of this run-of-the-mill guy. Matthew 13 tells us he works in carpentry. And so, you know, there's just nothing particularly remarkable about him. And so here's the two of them, and they're preparing to be married. They're engaged to be married, and, and you know, they're just, they're just kind of planning, I believe, to live kind of this pretty run-of-the-mill life together, right? Nothing flashy, maybe have a few kids, you know, work, work hard. They'll go to the synagogue each week, and, and, you know, probably just trying to stay out of the way of the occupying Roman army. And, and you know, I mean, if they came to church here, you probably wouldn't even know it because they're just just this kind of ordinary blue-collar couple like so many of us in the room. And then God interrupts their story. Right? God interrupts and he comes to Mary, sends an angel to Mary and says, Mary, you're about to be pregnant even though you're a virgin. Joseph, you're about to be a dad even though you and Mary have not consummated The marriage, yet. God literally interrupts their regularly scheduled programming of their lives with this ridiculously fantastical news that says, you are about to do something that you could not have possibly fathomed. 
There's no way that Mary or Joseph could have possibly been prepared for that news. There's no way that they could have ever dreamed that that was going to be them, that God did that through. There's no way that they could have ever seen it coming because God completely breaks the mold on this plan. It's never happened before, or had never happened before. It has not, to my knowledge, ever happened since. That a woman has gotten pregnant without the, shall we say, help of a man. Right? That there's, there's a process to these things. Virgins don't get pregnant. Like, ever. Right? And so, this, there's no way she could have dreamed this up or fathomed this. And yet, the, it, even though it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, they both receive this news. And what is their response? Yes. Yes. Mary says, yes. May it, may it be that what you've said comes true. I'll, 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 I'll go with the plan. Joseph, the Bible says, he wakes up from that dream and he obeys. Yes. And he, and, and, and he goes for it. So let me ask you this question this morning. When's the last time God interrupted your life? When is the last time God interrupted your life? And, and you know, I'm not necessarily talking about in like this cataclysmic, change the entire history of the world kind of way. Like I'm still waiting for that one too, okay? Uh, that's not what I mean. Not, not quite to the scope we're talking about here. But I, I'm talking about when is the last time that, you know, God just nudged you and said, hey, you know the plan that you thought was the plan? It's not the plan. When's the last time that that happened? God, hey, I've got something better for you. We talked about this to one, you know, some degree a few weeks ago when we were talking about Naomi and Ruth. And we were talking about how, you know, their plan, or Naomi's plan in particular, was interrupted by some tragedy and some death, and there was some, you know, some really rough stuff that happened. Okay, but that's not, and, and then what did God do? He redeemed that situation, and that's wonderful. It's awesome when God redeems those types of plans, but that's not really what I'm talking about here this morning. I'm talking about uh, that God approached you proactively. It didn't involve tragedy. It didn't involve, like, you were sort of forced to change the plan because things went badly. This is like, hey, things are going great. We're cruising along, and then God just speaks to your heart and says, hey, there's a little bit of a change of direction here. I want to interrupt the plan. When's the last time that God did that and that you followed it up with a response of obedience, a response of yes, to say, yes, God, you can interrupt, interrupt my life and I'm going to take the steps of faith that you're asking me to take. When's the last time that that happened to you? Because I'm going to tell you today, I believe that if, if you will let him, God wants to interrupt some of your, some of our lives. He wants to literally take whatever direction we're headed and in almost dramatic fashion, he wants to reroute our lives. He wants to radically alter the direction that you're heading. And the question is, will you say yes? Will you say yes? Here's what you need to know this morning. We're going to spend a while on this, this point. God didn't create you to be ordinary. Did you know that? I know a lot of us, we probably look in the mirror and we kind of just feel like that might be a good word to describe us. I just feel like just a regular guy or a regular gal. I'm just kind of ordinary. God didn't create you to be ordinary. In fact, I'll go so far as to say this. He never, 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 never designed you to just sort of go through life at this whole hum ordinary pace. That's not who God created you to be. God did not design you to, you know, sort of just, you know, I'm just going to do sort of typical suburban America things and just kind of live life just mostly comfortable, nothing too crazy, and hopefully I can just kind of get to retirement in one piece, and then I'll just eventually kind of fade off into the sunset and one day get to heaven. That does not represent God's best plan for you. I'm certain of it. I am certain that it does not. The reality is that I don't think any of us, not a single one of us, I don't think we can begin to fathom the grand scope of God's plan for our life. We can't even begin to wrap our mind around the huge plans that God has for us. Let me, let me show you this. Go back with me to Matthew, uh, that Matthew 1 passage, verse 22. Listen to, listen to what Matthew writes. He writes, all this took place, Remember, this is when the angels interacting with Joseph. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. 
The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. What is Matthew referring to here? He's referring to a prophecy that had been spoken to the prophet Isaiah or by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 7.14 says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now listen, if you get nothing else out of this message, I, I need you to just really focus in for the next about 10 minutes because I feel like what, what I'm going to say over the next 10 to 12 minutes literally is going to change the direction of, of several people's lives. Literally, if, you, if you'll just hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking here. Okay, so if you don't want that, a change of direction in life, just plug your ears or something, okay? Because this is going to really, God is going to use this, okay? 700 years. 700 years is the amount of time that passes between Isaiah 7.14 when that prophecy is first spoken and when Jesus actually shows up on the scene. 700 years. Okay, that's a big gap. Here's what I want you to see. God's plan for Mary didn't start in Luke chapter 1. It didn't start in Matthew chapter 1. It didn't start 13 years earlier when she was born into her parents' household. It didn't start nine months before that when her mama got pregnant. Okay, God's plan for Mary was in the works 700 years beforehand. That's how long he was working on her plan. Long before Gabriel ever showed up and announced to her that she was going to be pregnant, long before uh, before she had any idea what God's plan was, he was orchestrated hundreds of years working on it. And the same is true of Joseph. Okay, that same prophet, Isaiah, again, 700 years later, declared this in Isaiah chapter 9. For to us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and uh, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And so what what Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, what he's declaring, or one of the things he's declaring, is that the Messiah was going to come through the heritage, through the line of King David. Okay, That was in reference to something that had been spoken to King David even 300 years before that, Okay, where the Lord spoke to David and said, the Messiah is going to come through you. Okay, And so for a thousand years, the plan has been in the works for the for the Messiah, for Jesus to come through the heritage of King David. Well, guess who's in King David's family line? Joseph. Joseph is the answer to that prophecy. And that's why if you read the genealogies in Luke chapter 3 or in Matthew chapter 1, that's why, why they put those in there to prove, especially to the early church readers, like, hey, this guy Joseph, like he's, a leg- he's got a legitimate claim to be the earthly father of the Messiah. And so what I want you to see, God didn't start Mary's plan when the angel showed up. It was work- in the work 700 years. He didn't start Joseph's plan the night that Joseph had a dream in Matthew chapter 1. That was in the works for a thousand years before Joseph was on this earth happened when Nathan came to, the prophet Nathan came to David and said, your throne will endure forever. Listen, do you think for one second that you can grasp the scope of God's plans for you? No, no way. God's been working on your plans since long before you were born. Do you think that that February 14th, 1977 rolled around and this kid, Ryan Conrad, was born, I know, almost 40, if you're good at math, almost, not quite, okay? (laughs) Do you think that Valentine's Day, 1977, appeared on the calendar and all of a sudden God is in heaven? Oh, crud! Another kid was born. Oh, I don't have a plan for him. What are we going to do with it? Gabriel, Michael, quick, let's give him, uh, uh, what do we, uh, just give him the, the cookie cutter American dream. Here, just go. Okay, next. <laughs> do you think that that's how that works? That God is just surprised when you showed up on the scene? No, he's been working on your plan long before you ever took a breath. Listen to what King David writes in the book of Psalms 139. 
For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Listen, I don't really care what the circumstances of your birth were. You might have been born into a situation like this next picture. Mom, dad, healthy home. Maybe you grew up where everything was provided for you. You always knew that your parents loved you and loved each other, and there was never any concern that there was ever going to be something like divorce or anything like that. You just knew there was a security. You might have grown up that way. Or maybe you grew up like this guy that we heard from last weekend, Brian Lansing, if you remember his story. Remember his story? He was dropped on the doorstep of an orphanage in India when he was days old. was adopted when he was eight months old. He's never in his entire life known who his mother and father, earthly mother and father, really are. Maybe that was uh, circumstances that, that you grew up in, that, that you felt unwanted by your earthly parents. Can I just say, by the way, that if your earthly parents made you feel like an unplanned mistake, that they may have made you feel that way, but can you just know you were never, ever, ever, ever an unplanned mistake to God? Amen. Never. Were you an unplanned mistake to God? Reggie Dabbs, this next picture, this guy here, he's an evangelist that travels the world over leading teenagers to Christ. In fact, he's come to the St. Cloud area before, uh, back when I was in youth ministry, some other youth pastors and myself, we collaborated, we had him come to Stock Rapids High School, and, and he comes in, and he does this presentation, and it's awesome, and he's just got this way of just endearing teenagers to himself, and then that, at night, they come back, and they do a rally, and all the teenagers that were at school seem to want to come back that night, you throw some free pizza their way, or whatever, they come back, and he shares his story about how Jesus changed his life. And in his and, and people and teenagers get saved by the hundreds when this guy speaks. But part of his story, this guy right here that is literally being used by God for incredible purposes all over the world, he's the son of a prostitute. And in his own story, he is literally the result, conceived as the result of a $20 bill. That's his story. Okay? Conceived as the result of blatant and open sexual sin, sin, still God did not view him as a mistake. Okay, God didn't view him as an accident. Reggie Dabbs's days, according to Psalm one thirty nine, were numbered before a single one of them came to be. Brian Lansing's days were numbered long before he came in here last weekend and impacted some of some of your lives. Right? Would anybody look at that baby all those years ago lying on the doorstep of an orphanage and think this kid is one day going to impact the lives of people in St. Cloud? Minnesota? Nobody would ever thought that, but it happened. Why? Because God had a plan. God had a plan that he has been putting into motion long before a single one of their days was ever ever lived would anybody have looked at mary and joseph and said you know this couple they look like the perfect candidate to give birth to the most important person that's ever lived no most people would have looked at them and said teenage girl from avon <laughs> probably not going to change the world teenage girl from jacob's prairie doesn't even count as a town probably not going to change the world. And yet, change the world it did because God had been working on a plan and he has been working on your plan, the plan of your life as well. Okay, it's much larger than you can understand, much bigger than you can ever wrap your mind around. That, that passage in, in one, Psalm 139 says this, that his thoughts regarding you outnumber the grains of sand. I have here a jar. I weighed this yesterday. It's about two and a half pounds of sand. Okay? I think anybody could look at this amount of sand right here and say, compared to even the smallest beach you've ever visited, this is just nothing. Even a small beach, this is nothing. 
you probably carry more sand home in your swim trunks and your towel and your, your, your sand toys accidentally when you go to the beach than is in this jar. And yet, uh, people that are smarter than I have, have have figured out the formula, and they say that for every pound of sand, there is approximately 7,000 grains of sand that make up that. So this is somewhere in the vicinity, obviously it's not an exact sign, something like 14,000 grains of sand that are in my hand right now. Okay, what does Psalm 139 say? That God's thoughts towards you outnumber the sand on the seashore. Okay, that this tiny little bit that doesn't even represent a fraction of the smallest seashore that you could fathom. Okay, that's 14,000 right there. What does that tell me? You could not possibly put a number on the, the amount of thoughts that God has towards you. And that, that word thoughts in the Hebrew, when it says his thoughts towards you, the word thoughts in the Hebrew is actually much closer to our word for the word purpose. Okay, his purposes for you, his plans for you. Okay, they are uncountable. God did not create you to be an ordinary being. God created you for so much more. He didn't design you to be boring. He didn't design you to be unimportant. Do you know how God created you? In his image. In his image. Genesis 1, 27 says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Your life was created to look like his. And now... Okay, that's every human on the planet is created in God's image. But now, for us that are Christians, this is even greater because now in the church age, we have this tremendous privilege. Listen to what 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 says. It says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Keep that verse on the screen, if, we, if you would, for a second. Okay? Here's what you have to understand. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that the veil in the temple was torn in two. That previous to that experience, that veil separated man from from the presence of God, right? Literally, that veil just represented a separation. And that was all of the Old Testament era was that way. Jesus dies on the cross. The veil is torn from top to bottom. And since that time, that's why that, that verse talks about the unveiled faces. What that's a reference to is this, that you and I in the church age, we have 24-7 access to God. Isn't that awesome that you can go to God at 2 in the morning and he's not asleep, Right? That, that the Holy Spirit within you, it doesn't matter what time of day, what time of night, what's going on, he's there readily available for you to interact with him, okay? That's unique to us in the church age that the Old Testament saints did, didn't have that experience, okay? That veil was torn, and so now, uh, here's what this is, is telling us, is that not only are you and I created in God's image, but now because of that unveiling of God's presence, now you and I are being transformed more and more and more and more and more into his image, okay? So think of it this way. When, when my little son, Theo, who's a little over a year, when he was born, okay, he was born in my image by virtue of the fact that he was human, right? But not too many people would look at that shriveled up little kid and be like, that's a spitting image of Pastor Ryan. If you thought that, shame on you, because I'm much better looking than a shriveled up little kid. Okay? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I, either you're laughing because that's not true, or I don't know. Okay. He was in my image because he was human, and he was a son, but, but he didn't really reflect me yet. But now, a year has passed, and now he started to fill in, and now more and more and more every day, little Theo starts to look a little bit more like Daddy. Right? He's being transformed. He's already in my image, but now he's being transformed into my image. Listen, you were born as a human being into God's image, but now when you say yes to Jesus, okay, now you're reborn. Okay, now there's this transformation process that begins, and you're starting to look more and more and more and more like his likeness, okay? So how does that happen? The Holy Spirit who is within us, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit's inside of you, and that's what 2 Corinthians 3 says, is that the, the Lord, who is the Spirit, is the one that's bringing about that transformation. That's why Romans 8, and 9, uh, Romans 8 verse 9 says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to God. So if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit's inside of you and he is transforming. So let me just add all of this up. 
Okay, let me add all of this up so that you can just feel ultra uber encouraged this morning, okay? And maybe you're not good at math, so I'll do the adding for you, okay? He had all of your days numbered before you ever took a breath, okay? That's one, okay? His thoughts regarding you outnumber the grains of sand, okay? So that's two, okay? He's made you in whose image? His image, okay? So that, that means he didn't turn you into a slug because God's not a slimy slug, right? He made you awesome in his image, okay? Then what did he do? He placed his spirit inside of you. So he said, this person's worth enough and valuable enough. I'm going to place myself, my very spirit, I'm going to inhabit them. I'm going to put my spirit inside of them. Then he removed the veil, right, that, that hindered your ability to have relationship. He removed that so you could have ongoing relationship with you. He's continually transforming you to make you a better reflection of him. Where do we get the idea that God ever designed us to be ordinary? Where could we ever come up with that? God has made you to be awesome. He has planned so much bigger than you just surviving and sort of coasting into heaven. That's never, never, never been the plan. How can we be okay with just being ordinary, with just being average? God doesn't see you as average. In his viewpoint, you're anything but that. Friend, listen. God wants to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming today. He wants to take this plan that you've just kind of been drifting along and he wants to interrupt it. The question is, are you going to say yes? He won't force you to say yes. He won't. If you're content to go on living average, then God will allow that. Joseph said yes. Mary said yes. And when they did, everything changed. What if you allowed God to interrupt your story as Pastor Jeff comes? What if you allowed God to interrupt your story by saying yes to whatever it is he's placing in your heart today? That's what our youth pastor, who you're going to hear from in just a second, Jeff Heitzman, he did that a few years ago, and I just felt like I could share his story, or he could share his story, and he could probably share it better than I can. So give it up for Jeff. He's doing an awesome job with our teenagers. Nice job with community this morning. You're going to hear from him in just a few moments here. So basically, uh, the calling, the, the life change wasn't as crazy as uh, having a baby without consummating or anything like that. But when God calls you to something, even if it's not like that, it still seems just as big at that time. And so uh, here I am. I'm two years into college. I have a very big interest in banking and business. And so I'm at St. Cloud State University doing uh, business management and finance. And so I'm doing that as I'm doing kids ministry at a church that I used to go to. And so I'm doing those two things, and, and I was completely fine. I've always said growing up that I wanted to work at a bank. I wanted to be a manager. I wanted to do all these things. And so that was my, my, my life goal was to be a banker, was, was to work in a bank and to do that. And so I was excited, and, and I was doing good in school. And one day I was doing kids ministry, and one of the kids, of course, they threw out a toy into the hallway because that's what kids do when you're in kids' ministry. They don't listen. They just throw stuff at you. And so youth kids do that too still, I've, I've noticed. But anyway, <laughs> any free shot they get at me, they take. So. But, uh, so the kid threw this little Lego thing out into the hallway, and so I walked out into the hallway, and across the hallway was the youth room that I've been in multiple times. I, I, I grew up in youth ministry there, and... and and so the room wasn't anything like, oh, wow, there's the youth room. I've seen it multiple times. And as I picked up that Lego, I stood up, and it said youth room on it. And I've seen that sign before, but for some reason, it just made me stop. And I looked at it, and I felt God saying, I'm calling you to youth ministry. I need you to speak to the next generation of youth. And I started staring at the thing and, I, and, and the sign, and I was just like, that is insane. I'm already two years into college. I have to switch my degree. I spent all that money already on those degrees. I'm basically almost done, in a way. And, and, and I have all these other plans that I want to do. And, God, you know that I stutter. See, growing up, I had a, a really bad stuttering problem. I couldn't even like get a sentence out before stuttering. 
In fact, in sixth grade, it got so bad we had to read uh, a play thing, and I couldn't even read two lines, and I had to leave the room, and, and people were laughing at me and stuff like that. So I said, God, you know that I can't speak in front of people. I can't do that. And so he calls me to it, and I didn't say yes right away. I'm going to be honest. I didn't say yes right away. I tried to join on the thing and run and say, I'm going to do another year of, <laughs> I'm going to try to do another year of this business management thing. And so I did, an, I did another semester, and, and it, it just didn't feel right. I, I, I felt this constant calling on my life, and I knew that God wasn't going to force me into this. He wasn't going to just keep saying, well, I called you, I called you, I called you, and he wasn't going to keep forcing me into it. If I didn't want it, he wasn't going to drag me into it because that's not, because the heart needs to be in it. And so finally I gave in and I said, you know what, God, I'm, 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 I'm going to do youth ministry. And so I stopped going to St. Cloud State, but I had enough credits to actually finish my business management degree at the tech college. So I went there for, to take two classes, just get that out of the way. And then I, I went to the Liberty University online. I did a two-year program in eight months to try to get it done as fast as possible. So I did a, a two-year degree in eight months. So I got to thank my wife and everyone who supported me and watched the kids while I was up till 4 a.m. writing papers and stuff. But... I got through that, and, and I graduated with a 3.9 GPA from Liberty University, and then right after then right after that, I went through a place to get ordained, and so the Omega team ordained me, and so just since March of this year, I've been ordained as, as a pastor, and so basically what, I, what, what I'm trying to say, and, and, and my story is, I had my whole life plan. I was already basically there, because I was working at a bank at the time too, which I still do, but I was, I, was, I was working at a bank. I had all my goals, all my dreams right in front of me, and God said, no, I'm going to change it right here. I want you to go and do this as well, and so with the stuttering and everything else, and I, and, I, and I still stutter, and I still mess up on a couple of words and stuff like that during times, but I know that he can take my ordinary being and make it extraordinary, and that's what he does to all of us. And so I want to encourage you that if God is calling you to do something and it seems crazy, that's perfect. That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be crazy. It's supposed to be because he wants you to take that ordinary thing because then when you do that, people are like, hey, Jeff, you used to stutter in sixth grade where you couldn't even read off a paper. How are you doing youth ministry? It's through God. And so that opens the door, too. So just want to encourage you with that story today. Awesome. What if God interrupted your life in that way? Would you let him? Would you let him reroute you from your career choice, your career plan. You might be farther down the road in, in whatever career you're in. What if God tapped you on the shoulder and said, new plan, I'm going to send you off to do this. Instead, would you say yes? What if God interrupted you and said, hey, I want you to adopt an orphan like a couple did in the lives of our speaker last weekend, Brian Lansing. It would cost a lot of money to do that. It would cost a lot of, of, of effort and energy to do that. But but you could change a life that way. Would you say yes? What if God nudged you and said, I want you to begin to impact that person in your neighborhood? That I want, I want you to be the guy or the gal in your neighborhood that the young people, they want to come hang out. They're always in your yard hanging out with your family. Why? Because, because when they come, they get life. They, maybe they don't even know that that's what they're getting, but they're getting life when they come to your place. And you're the guy they just want to come and tinker on things in the garage with and, or, or, or the gal they want to just come and, and learn from. What if, what if it was that that God wanted to nudge you with? What if it was that God said, hey, I want you to start sacrificing some of your time and I want you to start volunteering at a food shelf or a, or a shelter or down at Place of Hope, something like that. What if God nudged you and said, here's the interruption. I'm going to send an adult your way that I just want you to start taking them out for coffee and just rubbing shoulders with them and just giving them whatever spiritual knowledge you do have. You don't have it all figured out, but I want you to give them what you do have and just begin to impact their life that way. You know what that's called? Discipleship. What if God said, I just want you to find this person or I'm going to send this person to you and you're going to 
Disciple them. What if, what if God said, I want you to take in a hurting teenager or a neighborhood kid and just invest your life in them? I want to show you a video clip here in about five seconds of, of that type of situation. Here's what I want you to look for when we watch this clip, okay? Watch for the God interruption that must have taken place. Watch for the, the person who said yes, okay? Go ahead and roll that clip. I never knew what it would feel like being this far from home. It is a long way from Vietnam to central Minnesota. Adapting to life and culture here isn't the easiest. And neither is being an outsider. Finding friends is hard. The new language is tough. The homework is tougher. And it's not easy to get around when no one can drive you. And it is really cold. I decided to pick up soccer. A game I have always wanted to play back home, but never could because there was nowhere to play. I love it. And I have gotten really good at it. But most of all, this is where I met Phil. Phil is a great player and even a better coach. Learning the game doesn't always come quick, but Phil makes the process simpler. It didn't take long for us to grow close. And this new friend was exactly what I needed. Phil has been helping me with homework and giving me a ride when I need it. He shares car and his time, and eventually he shares his story. I went with him to a group that was part of that story, Band of Brothers. From the outside, it looked like a bunch of guys hanging out, but it is so much more. It didn't take long to feel like I was part of the family and I knew I wanted to go back. Now I'm beginning to hear everyone's story. Stories of hurt, stories of pain, and stories of hope. And I'm also hearing the story of Jesus. I don't know what I'm going to do with all of this yet, but I know I'm on a journey. I know that I will be back again. Being on the other side of the world is hard, but these guys are here for me. I'm welcome. I'm accepted. I'm loved. And I am home. As the band comes this morning, what if God interrupted your life? to do that, to be a fill. I mean, that's not just some made-up story that we pulled out of the Twin Cities or... That's right here, central Minnesota. I don't know those people, okay? That's a Youth for Christ clip, and that's something that's happening over there, which we support them and believe in them. But that story is right here, central Minnesota. That's a kid that shows up here, probably confused and lots of questions, and then what does it take? One guy who says, you know what, I'm going to give. I'm going to give him my time. I'm going to give this kid rides around places. If you've ever given somebody a ride, giving people rides places yeah. isn't the most fun thing or the most glamorous thing, but it's making a difference in this kid's life. What if God said, I want to interrupt your life and do that in the heart of a young person or the heart of, a, of a, an adult or the heart of a co-worker? And God wanted to, to use you. Listen, being interrupted, as Jeff's story told us this as well, it doesn't always mean selling everything and, and moving to Africa and going to be a missionary. It could mean that. For some people, it does mean that. But more likely than that, it just means walking across the street and finding the person that God has placed before you. 
It doesn't mean necessarily selling all of everything you have and giving all your money to the church. Maybe it just means God's nudging you to be a little bit more generous than you have been with what, with what you have. God interruptions, they'll always involve faith. They'll almost always involve steps of obedience. They'll almost always involve sacrifice. And that can be the tough part. All of us want to do great things for God. I believe that. But can we accept the cost? You know, the moment Mary said yes, she took on a big responsibility. Nine months of pregnancy. That was a sacrifice. On her body. That was a sacrifice. But she did it. That couple, Joseph and Mary, they took on a sacrifice. Do you know that from the moment Jesus was born, they went into a life basically of exile. That psychotic King Herod wanted Jesus dead. And you know what it meant for Mary and Joseph? They couldn't go back to Nazareth right away. They went to Egypt for a while. They had to hide out. Basically, you know, staying off the radar. That was a sacrifice. It cost them something to obey. But obey they did. And in time, every last one of our lives has been impacted by their willingness to obey. Because that boy that was born became that man, Jesus, who went to the cross and provides all of us with the hope that we have. What is God calling you to do today? How is he wanting to interrupt your life? Will you say yes? With every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. You're here, hearing this message today and maybe, maybe you don't necessarily know exactly what the God interruption looks like yet. Maybe you haven't quite pinpointed it just yet. But maybe you just have a, a sense, one of two things probably, either that God has already tried to interrupt your life and you've kind of pushed it off. You've kind of ignored it. Maybe, maybe you resonate even with what Jeff said, that he didn't respond right away. And you know what God's been stirring, but you've kind of just, uh, let's wait and see. And you have a sense today that God is saying, nope, that is me. That really is me. And it's time to respond. Or maybe you're just here and you have a sense that says, God, I don't know what the, what the interruption is. I don't know what the call is, but I have a sense that you want to interrupt my life. And I'm tired of living just cozy, comfortable, cruising along, just drifting to the end. God, I want you to use my life for something that matters, whether that's to impact a kid or whether that's to do something on the mission field or whether that's to impact my neighbor or whatever it is, God, that you want. God, I want to do it. And I know it's going to cost me something, but I'm willing to accept that cost for the call you have on my life. Would you raise your hand if you feel like either of those scenarios describes where you're at this morning? Hands going up all across this auditorium. Awesome. You're saying, I am, God, I am open to your interruption. If you ha keep your hand up. Just keep your hand up if you raise it this morning. Okay? I bet you there's a dozen, 15, 16, 17 hands probably at least. Lord God, right now, we make our declaration this that we will say yes. God, we say yes to you. God, that if you want to, if you need us to quit our job and go another direction, then God, yes. If you need us to sacrifice our time and invest in another life, then God, the answer is yes. God, if you need us to lay down some of our finances or our possessions that we have here on this earth, then God, the answer is yes. It's yes. It's yes, God will go. We accept your call. We accept this interruption. God, we don't want to live ordinary lives. God, I'm tired of living ordinary life. God, I want to do things extraordinary like you've called us to do them. God, I thank you that your word tells us that your plans, your purposes, your thoughts towards us, God, we can't even begin to count them. They're so numerous. God, they're so incredible and so intense, God, that you've had our life charted out. God, you didn't just start planning it now. God, you've had this plan in the works for hundreds of years. God, waiting for this moment in time, God, to launch us into something new and something great. God, we say yes. 
And God, now we pray you would help us. God, help us to keep now stepping forward into the call you've placed on us. God, we know there's going to be times it feels frightening, it feels scary. God, there's times it's going to feel like, like, like you're not there. God, there's going to be times where it's confusing. It's times it doesn't make sense. Times where we have lots of questions. God, through all of that, God, may we stand firm and continue marching forward in the call you've placed upon us. May we not retreat in fear or run away from your call over our life. And God, we, we know that you'll use it to impact your kingdom. God, we will give you all the glory, all the glory for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, hey, I think this is a pretty good start to this series. I'm really excited about where things are headed in the weeks to come. Don't forget to come back next Sunday. It's going to be awesome. Love you, church. Have a fantastic week.